Hey, good morning. My name is Jason Coyle, Operations Section Chief for Southwest Area Team 1. Today is Saturday, May 21st, and this is your operational update for the west zone of the Calf Creek Hermit's Peak Fires, Calf Canyon Hermit's Peak Fires. All right, last night uh, uh, we did get an infrared flight. They fixed the, the issue with the, the aircraft, and the acres that they recorded were 308,971. The fire still shown at 40% contained. There are 2,707 personnel assigned to the incident. So bef today I'm gonna go around three different maps and the intent behind that is to, to drill down on some of the areas where we're gonna be focusing our effort over the coming days. I try to give you a better understanding of the the challenges that we're facing in that area and where we see that we can find success. But before I did that, I wanted to talk a little bit about our process and, and how we come up with these plans and, and how we execute on these plans in the field. So there's a, a couple things that we worry about when we're making these plans. One is making sure that these plans have contingencies built into them. And so a contingency is basically, it's a fallback plan. Um, we often communicate those to among ourselves as far as a PACE model. So with the PACE model, the P is primary, A is alternate, the C is contingent, and the E is emergent. So when we're talking about the different plans that we make, we try to build those into the plans. So the primary is the one where we're putting most of our effort into, and the alternate is something that we think is a high probability of success, that if we, don't do, if we choose not to execute on the primary that we're at least considering, how we would execute on the alternate. The contingent is if some unfavorable condition occurs, that was something that we can fall back to. Oftentimes that's a line behind that line. It's um, something that's not as close to the fire's edge. Um, could be a road system in a lot of cases. And the emergent plan is when, uh, when things go really bad, what are we gonna do? And so we game all that out ahead of time to make sure that we that we, we don't have to think about what we should be doing in the moment. The other thing that we worry about is that optionality. And so there's a, a temptation, especially if you're the one, the person in my role that, that creates strategies, to think that you're doing your job really well when you create a strategy that has every one of the variables gamed out. The problem with doing that is that the variables are, are always based on assumptions, right? Because we're trying to define what a, a future state looks like, a future a condition in an environment that has variables that some are known, some aren't known, that may influence the, the, the fire and may influence our ability to, to get work done. And some of them, frankly, just aren't knowable. And so the, the, the assumption, the, the, the flawed assumption of planning is that the plan can be perfect, and it can't. There are certain things when we're building this long range strategy though that we should consider. And we consider this in a way that keeps it appropriately broad. And by keeping it appropriately broad, we allow crews in the field that are doing the work to, to execute the intent of the plan and make decisions to take advantage of the conditions that they find out there, or to at least reduce the disadvantage that those conditions present. So some of the things we think about when we're doing this is that timber on timber indirect lines are difficult to hold and, and lots of times, I shouldn't say lots of times, and there have certainly been times in my career at least where we've been unsuccessful doing that. So if you push a dozer line and you have timber on both sides of you, those are historically very difficult places to hold it because the conditions that cause the fire to burn really well on one side, probably the same conditions that'll cause it to burn really well on the side that you don't want the fire. The other thing that to, to keep in mind is when you're talking about timber, unburned lines are rarely effective. So punching a line in, and in a sense, even the lines I talked about in the, when we go around the contingency line, 300 foot wide, cleaned out and everything, you can't just leave those there and be like, yep, the fire's gonna come into it and it's gonna stop. Because as we know, the fire spots, sometimes a mile, upwards of a mile. And so just leaving that line there and thinking the work is done is not, it's not a good idea, it's a terrible idea, as a matter of fact. And, and the main reason for that is that when you think about, you know, if you, 
if you looked at the last week of this fire and you looked at how many days it grew, it's not growing the same amount every day. We have bad, especially over the life of this fire. You know, we've had some 30,000 acre days. We've had some thousand acre days. So if you leave that line in a place that you just think, all right, this is a good line. We'll wait for the fire to come to it. And there's a temptation for that when you don't want to burn more, you don't want to introduce more fire onto the landscape. But you wait for it. You know, what are the odds? Are the odds that it's going to hit it on a, one of those days when it only grows 1,000 acres? Or are the odds that it's going to hit your line on one of those days when it grows 30,000 acres? It's on the 30,000 acre days, right? So that fire hits your line on the 30,000 acre days. The conditions that cause it to grow 30,000 acres are not going to be favorable for holding that line. It grows by spotting in front of itself and catching new fires and the main fire running over it. If you watched the video last night from the fire watch, you can see that ember wash and everything coming over there, over the fires, uh, you know, coming over the ridge and then putting little spot fires out in front of it. So we, we can't do that. It, it would be foolish to think that. Uh, the other thing that, that adds to our, our success potential is fuel transitions. Sometimes those fuel transitions are, are broad landscape level fuel transitions. Sometimes they are the, you know, the stuff where you go from up high in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the spruce fir, down a little bit lower, you're in ponderosa, then you're in juniper, then you're out in more of the, the grass flats. Sometimes fires run out into the grass and that's where we catch them. But there's also these, these micro transitions, if you will. There's areas where the fuel changes and it could be because there's more aspens in that area. There could be, a, it could be a green meadow. It could be just the difference between the south and the north side of a ridge. So that's one of the areas that in the, in the broader planning we'll miss. And that's another reason why this process that we do is cyclical and we get information from the field to help continue to improve that plan. And finally, um, something that is really important for us to remember is, is that firing under un unfavorable conditions is, is unlikely to be successful in most cases. And so what that really means is that on those 30,000 acre days when you're like, oh no, it's going to hit my line. And if it hits my line, I know that line isn't going to hold, so I better light off of it and, and, and start to move fire back towards that main fire. Well, that's not the day to do it. The day to do it is, is before that condition occurs. So what all that does together is it leaves you with some choices. And it leaves you with choices that are really bound by what days are available. So you have to make decisions on what you're going to do with all these, you know, with assumptions and everything else baked in, not based on what you think is the best day to do it of, of these conditions that you can imagine, but what day is the best day to do it of the days left before the fire does it itself. So that's the whole key of this, this strategic planning process. And last thing before I get to the map is that, you know, the, this, I said it was cyclical. And so what happens is that we, we use analytics, we use different products, different modeling and everything to help inform us to the potential that exists and help us to try to exploit areas of opportunity. Um, some of those models are, are models on fire behavior that I'm sure you've seen like Stuart will show. Other models are, like one we have is called Wind Ninja, coolest model name out there, I think. And what that does is it, is it tries to simulate the terrain's influence on the wind. So yesterday, we, um, or days prior, we had run some wind ninja models on the area above Angostura. And what it showed us was that there are certain drainages where under strong southwest winds, that the, the drainages were actually blowing the opposite direction. The place where the, um, the fire grew to the, north, to the northwest that prompted the evacuations is a 73 quarter. The, the model didn't show us that the winds were gonna blow to the northwest in that area. Uh, although when you looked at the video, you could certainly see that they were. But even though at a granular level, you know, drainage by drainage, those models don't tell us what's up as far as exactly what's going to occur. What they do do is they show us the potential. So that helps us with those assumptions we make for our planning. So instead of assuming then that, that a, 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 a southwest wind that we feel in Taos or, you know, down in Las Vegas is going to be the southwest wind that they feel in the fire, we know that those conditions on the fire may be different, and then that allows us to plan for them. So we use those analytics, and then we have people out in the field that are scouting it, that are looking to see what, you know, where the line location should be. 
And then we also have people that have been here for a long time, that local knowledge that we use to inform our decisions. We look at the historic conditions where they are right now versus the historic maximums and how fires behaved in other areas where those we call the energy release component and this burning index where the conditions were similar to the conditions we're seeing now. How did big fires behave in those conditions? And then finally, we red team our plan. So we have this plan and we put it all together. And then what we do is we go through some different processes to make sure that we're, number one, not, not overly influenced by our own biases and assumptions. Number two, that we're not subject to groupthink or not as subject to groupthink, where everybody's like, yeah, it's a great plan. Yeah, me too. I think it's a great plan. And next thing you know, you're, you're doing something that maybe only one person was thinking and everybody else was just parroting what they thought. So um, those processes, so maybe I'll talk about them in future days, but those processes are critical because it improves our decision quality and it improves our ability to execute. So last thing I'll tell you before I go to the map is that when, when we're talking about planning, I understand that there's certainly a sense of urgency that exists, especially if you've been out of your home and, or you're concerned about being evacuated or the fire's right next to, to, your, to your property. You, know, you may be like, hurry up and get this done. But I can tell you that the time it takes to plan has rarely been the problem with strategic success. It's that time that we try to hurry things up, that we make assumptions, and we go down, we make assumptions that are unnecessary and wrong, and we go down a certain path that all of a sudden we realize, oh, that's not right. We gotta go this way. It's basically the, the landscape level um, kind of version of asking for directions. You know that moment when you think you should probably ask for directions? Or you're out in the wood and you should check your woods and you should check your GPS, your compass when you're hunting. You're like, nah, I'm probably right. We need to avoid that just like I think at least my wife has told me that I need to avoid that when I'm driving. So anyways, with that, we'll get to the map. We're going to start on the big map here and, um, and then we'll go to the other map. So up here uh, by Pot Creek, the, the, this road coming out of Pot Creek has, has been improved. All the way to right here, and then you can see the, where the black X's are overlaying the pink axes, all the way to this, this parentheses where the division break is. All that that line has been put in, and, and it's it's a good looking line. We need to thin the timber out on both sides of it, but the the dozer line and everything is pushed into here. Starting over on the the east side, the 76 road has been improved, and uh, there's masticators that are removing the brush off the side of it, and then there's um, feller bunchers that are that are taking a certain number of the trees out to create that prescription that I talked to you guys about earlier about that 300 foot shaded fuel break and they've worked all the way up to this division boundary right here and now they're going to continue that work going off to the west you know this is a multiple day I'd say we have at least 10 maybe 14 days left to get this line put in the rest of the way across there and then potentially take this line and tie it all the way back down to the end of division kilo that's the work that's going on around the perimeter, along with yesterday. Um, so the power line that feeds Penasco and, and the, the 73 corridor and the Picaris Pueblo runs on the right side of the 518, on the east side of the 518 through this area. Everything south of Pot Creek, almost to where the big 518 is here. And there's no backup power to this area. There's no back line that back feeds, you should call it, but that comes in from a different area. So if this line gets damaged, then, then the, that entire area is without power until it can be repaired. So they went through and cleaned out around nine miles of poles yesterday. The crews did all the way along this area across this steep terrain. That gives them the opportunity to look at ways that we can help protect those lines in the event that we have to use the 518 road as a holding feature. And even if we're not able to protect the whole line, you know, the difference between burning you know, 10 poles and 100 poles is the difference between how long folks are out of there or without power after we're able after the fire is controlled in that area. All right, so with that, we're going to go over here to the far map where we test the cameraman's skill. And then we'll um, start over here since some of you listen to this on something that's just right outside of our zone break. So this dotted line is our zone to kind of orient you. There's Chacon on the left there. Up here is is Sierra Bonita and then Guadalapita is down here on the on the far right of this map. So there's some some heat yesterday underneath all those winds we saw, and um, 
you know, they're, they're, I know that they are going to talk about it, but they're, they're going to be putting water on that today and getting crews in there to work that little piece of heat right here to make sure that they can get that controlled. Off to the west of Chacon, well, we'll go down the 121 corridor first, and then we'll go up to the up to the left there to the west. Down the 121 corridor from Chacon, everything's looking really good, all the way up to about what we call drop point 172 here, which would be opposite of the B009 Alpha Road. A little bit of heat up here above the, the structures, and then we've got this dozer line that comes in here, and we still have heat up in these areas. This stuff on the east side of the road, you know, we've, we've talked about multiple different options of how we deal with this. And right now, the best option to reduce the burn severity, so to keep it from looking like a bunch of black sticks in here when we're done, is to exercise patience. Exercise patience and, and do uh, some aerial burning at nighttime with the drone to keep this fire even. So you can see this little this feature here is a ridge, is a spur ridge, one that goes into the drainage like this. So what we don't want to have happen is we don't want it to crawl down this spur ridge, fire to get established here, and then we get a, a, a normal south, southwest wind and run head fire up to the top of this ridge. It won't, it won't get out of our perimeter if it does that, but what it will do is it will just, it will create a bunch of black sticks in here. Under the conditions we have right now and the, the dryness of the fuel, it will basically make it where where this area is that it kills all the trees. So if we backfire underneath it and bring it down, then the burn severity is less and it allows us to do the work in a way that helps to preserve some of those those trees. And so that's the intent of that effort. You know, we want nothing better than to get people back in their home, get this fire down to our line, be able to put black all the way around the edge of it to show that it's controlled and then and then move the resources that are in the 121 corridor over to other areas where we need to commit them. But it's a balance from the amount of time it takes to complete the task to making sure that the task is done well. So that's why that's going on. Um, you know, I, I, if, if there's additional questions or concerns or criticisms, I'm sure we will hear about them, but it, w it would take new information to cause us to change that, that tactic right now. Until such time as we're successful with that or we find out that's unsuccessful or conditions change that make another alternative where we're able to, um, to, to achieve success with that other alternative, we'll keep doing that, and it's going to take a while. All right, going up here to Chacon to the west along this edge of the fire. So dozer line, hand line, all the way up to the top. This area between this northwest point that comes out like this and – well, this area to the northeast of that point that comes out like this, there's multiple spot fires from the previous days that have occurred out in here, so, and, and most of them are quite small. Crews are in there right now. Five hotshot crews are going to be working in there again today to not only secure this edge, but take care of all those spots. And it is literally crawling over logs on on a 12-12 pitch, so on a, on a you know, a, every foot you go forward, you go a foot up to be able to get those spots. And that is gonna take time. But until they get those spots, strong southwest winds still present the risk of that fire moving this way, and then continuing over towards Sierra Bonita, and then threatening Black Lake, and, and, and the 120 corridor and everything to the northeast. So the work's ongoing, it's slow, it's tedious, it's difficult, but they're making good progress. They're also making good progress around this, the area of fire up here below Martinez Pond. And with the, with the goal of being able to tie into this, this dozer line, we're able to bring dozer line up from the bottom. So it, it, I believe that by the end of tomorrow, we'll be able to get this perimeter tied in. And then it's going to be a matter of spending several days getting the rest of these spots out here. But once, once we get the perimeter tied in, um, you know, that's, that's going to present a huge advantage for us. Today they're talking about southeast to northeast winds. So, you know, the first emphasis, that's why the first emphasis is on this perimeter. But we're not going to lose sight of this. AirTAC knows about it. We briefed on it this morning during aviation. You're going to see helicopters up working in this area in coordination with the crews on the ground, dropping water. But, um, you know, as, the wind, as we get different forecasts in different wind directions, we prioritize different areas of the fire based on the threat that they, that they present. 
So everything else going down that way to the 518 corridor we can cover on this other map that I will back up to right now. All right, so to orient you to this blow up section of the fire, now remember these, these squares right here are a mile. So this is blown up, but that's still a lot of ground. And, and so if we start here, here's, here's Angostura. This is the Angostura Creek that runs up this way. This is Angostura Ridge opposite the 518 road on the northeast. So yesterday, even during the, those high winds, we were able to keep the fire west of, the Angus, of, of um, 518 there by Angostura. We um, did get some eddying winds, like I talked about about the wind engine model, that caused some of the, the spots. There's, I, you know, there, well, we can have a, a conversation over a beer one time about if I think those were spots or if they were holdovers or whatever. But suffice it to say, there's heat outside of where the previous perimeter was that became active. Became active and it ran up to the top of this ridge by Camolis Creek. And then this, I think this is, oh, there it is, the Camolis Cutoff right there. So just north of that area. And then it threw a bunch of embers down into this, this drainage right here. And those embers caught fire and then we had, you know, this, this, this area that pooched out yesterday. There's dozer line that's coming into here along an old road system. It was intended to be the, the, the exterior perimeter. And we'll see if we can pick this up with aircraft this morning. And if there's a way to tie these road systems or to tie this dozer line in to, to something else on this ridge and still keep this as a direct, as a more direct option. And then, so all this, that's what happened. So now I'll talk about what we're doing about it. So um, we had a, we had a management action point. So a line on the map that, that is a, um, a trigger that, that creates a place where we look at it and we go, all right, time to take some action. We pre-plan that action. And so that action was to make a recommendation for evacuations to the northwest there of the, the 73 corridor area. And, and so that breached that line. You know, we're going to work to get around this, but we recognize, especially today, like I said, under those northeast and southeast winds that are predicted, that that's the conditions that led to the three miles of growth right here. So three more miles of growth puts us right here on the, the edge of the community. I frankly don't think that's going to happen today because we're going to do we're going to put a significant amount of air power and and ground forces into preventing that from happening but the potential of that occurring and knowing that that has occurred in the very recent past is is what prompted the recommendation we made to the sheriff and then the subsequent actions that followed that recommendation with that being said today the the there's multiple efforts that are going on in here and i'm uh, i think i'll just go over here to the west and we'll start far out and go close in so this is where it says M all the way down here, up to Bear Mountain, they've got that road opened up and passable for heavy equipment. They're gonna to continue to work along Camoles Canyon to get that road opened up and passable all the way to Ripley Point. And this is where that optionality comes in. So this is a contingency line, but the option that'll face them right here is based on the, the efforts that crews are able to make on the fire's edge here, what do they do with that? Or do they take it down and come down to this this ridge system here through virgin timber, which is not, you know, that's, that mile is going to take a while. And do they tie into that fire's edge? And then we start plugging crews in to be able to go along this edge and plug crews in and start going around this edge. That is what we want to do. That, we, we don't want to take this fire out to the 518 road. Well, the reason why is because, see how steep this is? The darker these lines, closer they get together, the steeper it is. Anybody that knows this by Trace Ritos is really steep. You get fire down here, the ability of it to get over here is high. You get fire down here, the ability to get over here is high. So we want to go as direct as possible in there for the reasons I just stated. We will respond to the fire environment to take actions that protect the values. The tactical actions may be in here tight. That's what we'd like to do. It may be looking for some alternative to take another row or line in somewhere else further out. That seems unlikely given the terrain. It may be that we fall back to the, to the road system right here and try to burn out this triangle. It may be that we put a line in that goes all the way down here to, to the Scipio ski area and, and excludes the ski area and ties back in. And then we work off of that line to keep the fire to the east of it. It may be that we have to hold the 518 corridor and tie back in to where this, this line that's being constructed is and go all the way out and down like this. We don't know. We know that we will plan for each one of the contingencies. We'll allocate resources to each one of the efforts, 
based on the probability of success and the time it takes to complete them versus the time we have available. Um, but that's, that, that's, this is, you know, this is, there's a lot of complexity here and there's a lot of things that we need to figure out as we move forward. But as we do figure it out, if you will, that, that there's actions being taken. So there's actions being taken that support each one of those alternatives, direct along the fire's edge, scoopers and heavy helicopters dropping water on the front of the fire, crews being inserted along that edge to see if they can pick it up, dozers being um, moved up towards Bear Lake or Bear Mountain, and then back to the east towards Ripley Point to push in that line, scouting of lines going from Ripley Point down to the northeast, or to the northwest, sorry, towards, towards the Scipio Ski Resort, and improvement on the structure protection efforts all the way along the 518 corridor. In conjunction with that, there will be resources out looking in the 73 corridor area and beginning to evaluate structures to identify what structure protection needs are required in the event that that becomes necessary. So that's the suite of different actions that are taking place on the fire. All of that is, is being done with the strategic intent of preventing the fire from getting any bigger, keeping it south of the 518 if we do have to allow for some growth and, and east of that line. And then if we're not able to keep it south of the 518, then that's why we're still put, continuing on that contingency line that we talked about first on the northern side of the fire and continuing to improve along the 518 north from the 518-75 junction towards where it meets the edge of that uh, northern contingency line uh, near uh, Pot Creek. With that, I will end today's operational update. Thank you.